Well, I think we'll get started with our, our last session of the day. Um, you're going to be listening about capturing the emerging genetic engineering technologies to move the pork industry forward by Dr. Kevin Wells, Associate Professor of Animal Sciences, University of Missouri. Uh, after completion of his PhD at North Carolina State, Kevin Wells began a postdoc at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Beltsville, Maryland, in the Gene Evaluation and Mapping Laboratory. After two years, that postdoc was levied into a research geneticist position. In 2001, Kevin left USDA to work at a small biotech company, PPL Therapeutics. In 07, he returned to academia and has worked at the University of Missouri since then. He's currently an associate professor in the Division of Animal Sciences and is also the co-director of the National Swine Resource and Research Center and the National Swine Somatic Cell Genome Editing Center. So, very fitting for talking about emerging genetic engineering. Let's welcome Dr. Kevin Wells for our last session today. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear it coming back. Well, thanks for sticking around for the, the last show. Um, I'm going to, um, to try to bring everyone onto the same page, but I want to start. All right. So I'm going to do the most important thing first. So if you don't remember anything else, let's, let's stick on this slide for just a moment. So number one, I'm going to try to convince you today that every single thing that you can see in a pig that has a genetic basis, we can manipulate. So when people say, what kind of things can you do? We can do everything. Okay. So everything that has a genetic basis is open for genetic engineering applications. So the thing that's really going to drive this technology is the regulatory environment. It is the number one obstacle to genome uh, editing, that may be good to some of you, that may be bad to some of you. Uh, Congress can determine the fate of this. It looks like the uh, genetically engineered salmon will eventually meet the market. I heard on the drive up on NPR that they finally have the facility going in, in Indiana, so they ought to be on the market pretty soon. And Congress responds to constituency. So I get a lot of questions. When will the purge resistant pigs be available? How many people in the room have contacted their congressman to say, make this happen? You don't have to raise your hands, but if you haven't, you need to think about it. Because that is what's going to determine when these technologies are accepted. If you hate the technology, call them too. Right? I'm, I'm fine with either strategy. All right, so let's get into this. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to take you through an approved product, which is, is uh, the salmon, and I'm going to do that as an example. I'm going to take you through another success story. It's the purge resistant pigs. Um, and then I'm just going to have a haphazard collection of things that are, that are coming or are out there. And I'm going to try to, to uh, draw your attention to a few dates as we go, because people think of these as new technologies. And hopefully by the end of the day, they won't seem quite so new anymore. And out in the middle, I'm going to talk about some design nucleases. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to get some terminology out there. And this terminology has changed. So I've been doing genetic engineering since 1989, and the words change all the time. Some of that is for PR. And so, like the word transgene, that's typically not a good word today. I'm a genetic engineer. I'll own it. I make transgenes. I use transgenes. So a transgene is when you're thinking about transferring a gene that's originally from somewhere else. And to make this clear, we don't take a gene from a place and put it in a pig. We read the genome of some organism, and we find a gene that we like. We then write that same information into the pig genome. Right? So we're not doing some crazy crosses between all sorts of organisms. We find information in one organism that seems to be useful, and we move that same information into another organism. So uh, most geneticists read genomes. Genetic engineers write genomes. We edit genomes. Cisgenic is a very similar term, but you can think of that as just an extra copy. So when you think of a scenario where more is better, maybe we want to add another copy of a gene that a pig already has. For example, the people in this room that are of European origin or the Fertile Crescent have about 40 copies of the amylase gene. And we were just naturally selected for that, for those people that arose where agriculture began. The whole rest of the human population that's not from the Fertile Crescent and part of Europe, only has about three copies. Okay. So this happens in nature all the time. Sometimes more is better. 
And a cisgenic animal would be an animal that's got another copy that other individuals in the same species have. Uh, knockouts or when we remove a gene function, the PERS resistant animal is a knockout, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, the editing counterpart to that would be delete. Um, and then um, I'm always told not to use the word mutate in any type of, um, of environment that's not full of geneticists, but I'm a geneticist and, and we mutate things. Everyone in this room has mutations. It's absolutely natural. Just think of it as variations, changes, um, those sorts of things. And for this conversation, I'm going to use the word introgress a couple of times, and just think of that as change the version. Going to a thesaurus, picking another word that means essentially the same thing, but it might be different and better for some reason. And I'll give you an example of, of one of those. I also want to make clear um, that in today's world, when you hear gene editing, not genome editing, we're, we tend to be talking about these last three things. We're talking about either knockouts, or introducing a variation, or bringing something from one, one species to another, one population to another. All right. So I really like this, this graphic. Um, I wish I had a counterpart for pigs. This is from a poultry science uh, review of, from just a few years ago. I want to draw your attention to the 1957 model bird up there. Within 20 years, through selection alone, just selection, they doubled the size of those birds. So if you notice, that's the same 56 days at the bottom. That bird's twice as big in 20 years. In another 25 years, they more than doubled again. That bird is growing four times as fast through genetic selection. And it took about 45 years. That's happening in pigs, too. It's happening in beef cattle. But the timelines are very different. These guys have a very fast generation interval, and we're talking about 45 years. This happened in six weeks. This is an example where someone went to a genome and said, what's driving growth? What genes are controlling that? And moving that, writing it into the genome of a mouse. Notice the date. That's 1982. That was the paper that I saw that made me want to go into genetic engineering. These are not new technologies. And that is the very first example of an animal whose genome was modified and someone scratched their head and said, this is an agricultural trait. This could matter. That's a mouse and most of us don't eat mice, so it really doesn't matter. And, but the guys at, um, at USDA started to work on rabbits, sheep, and pigs. Um, if you notice those pork chops at the bottom, the one on the right is from the genetically engineered animal that has the same gene that went into those mice. Now, what hopefully you'll see is it didn't do the same thing because there's physiological difference between mice and pigs. And these pigs turned out to not to be very useful at all. Their muscles grew at a different rate than their bones, which distorted, caused the curvature in their legs. This was not a good idea, but until someone did it, we didn't know it wasn't a good idea. And that effort has since been abandoned. But the same sort of efforts continued for the people working with the salmon. This is exactly the same type of gene that we saw in the mouse and we saw in the pig, except they didn't give up. They kept figuring out what's wrong. And they ended up being able to make fish that make no more growth hormone. That's the, the, the transgene in this case. They don't make any more. They make summertime levels year-round. Okay? So as long as you feed them, they grow year-round. They don't typically grow year-round. These fish get to market in just over half the time on 80% of the feed, so 20% less feed. If we're going to try to feed the world, technologies like this matter. And that's reduced carbon footprint because it can be local. It's reduced demands. The other thing you may not be aware of is that for, for most salmon, at least 40% of the feed is wild-caught fish. And so it's, it's lower demands um, at, at many levels. So I want to try to convince you that the genetically engineered food animals can, have been, will be, approved for human consumption. This is not pie in the sky. Those fish will be available, my guess is by the end of this year, you'll start to see those showing up in grocery stores in Indiana. Right, so it's, it's on the way. <clears throat> so back to the list, and um, we saw that before. If we look at this box, this is the hot topic that you hear periodically. You hear people talking about gene editing, Maybe the phrase CRISPR comes up. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to put 
some of that into perspective. So essentially, in all of these technologies, they do the exact same thing. And I'm going to go through a, a couple slides in a minute to explain what they do. But there's different technologies developed in different years. And it doesn't matter how all of these came to be. But what you see is in 1994, we learned that we could go into a genome and make a cut on purpose at a place. Right? That's all these things do. They're designed enzymes that cut the genome in a spot. And I'm going to show you why that's important in a minute. Those were replaced by some engineered nucleases, these things, finger nucleases. Uh, again, it, their, their history is not important for this discussion, but notice the timeline, not a new technology. When talons came along, what changed, and this is just another technology to do the same thing, what changed is it, is it made it relatively inexpensive. So the meganucleases were almost impossible to do for the average academic lab. Uh, the zinc fingers you could do, but it was around $35,000 an attempt, and only about half of them worked on a good day. Um, when the talons came along, that price dropped to around 2000 instead of 25 to 30 depending on the year. And um, probably three out of five of those worked. And then when the CRISPR technology came along, everything changed. So I can design a functional CRISPR for under 20 bucks. Right? Very, very different. And they almost always work. So what has happened, what is new when you hear CRISPR, is the bar has been lowered for the skill level required to enter in this field. So now, academic labs all across the country, people in their garage can do gene editing. Because the amount of information, the amount of skill, the amount of technology that you need to pull this off has been dramatically reduced. And the costs are down. That's what's new. They didn't really offer any new technology as far as what we can do. What's new is who can do it. And it's almost anybody. All right, so I'm going to take a moment to just show you how this works, because i got lots of questions. What's really going on? So if you see that blue pair of scissors up in the left-hand corner, think of that as that design nuclease. It cuts DNA at a predetermined spot, hopefully one spot in the whole genome. And so those scissors you can see can cut, and below that you see what's represented as a break. You see double-stranded pieces being, being released with a little overhang there. And most of the time, through a process called non-homologous enjoining, again, not important, those just get rejoined, they get fixed. So it cuts, makes a double-stranded break, and it gets fixed and nothing happens. It's a futile cycle, it's just going on and on and on. But those scissors are still there, and they keep cutting. And eventually, something happens. In this case, you can see the ghosted out region has been chewed back. There's enzymes that have removed those bases, those individual letters in the genome. And when that gets rejoined, it doesn't get cut again because it's now a different sequence, and our scissors can't cut that sequence. So what happens is, in the genome, at that spot, changes occur. Predetermined. We're going to make changes right here. Out of the 23,000 genes, we're just going to change this one. And that's a powerful technology. The other thing that can happen is, instead of it getting chewed back on both sides, only one side gets chewed back, it gets put back together. You see it in the middle with a little gap. And it gets filled in with the wrong base, because errors occur. That's the way mutations occur. And it's shown as a little red dot in there. I think this works, a little red dot. And so that can either get corrected, and you have this piece, futile cycle, we're back up the top, gets cut again, just round and round and round. Or the other side gets changed, and so now you've introduced a single base change. So out of the... Um, 3.1 billion bases that are there, we changed one. Tiny little change. And so if it's a design change, that could be the difference between being particularly useful and not. So we've shown that zinc fingers work in pigs. We've got some pigs that are, that are express a jellyfish gene that makes them fluorescent green. It's pretty handy to test stuff on. Um, we showed we could go in and make that gene stop working. Um, so the pig on the right still has the GFP gene. The one on the left, we've changed one base, and it doesn't work anymore, so we've, we've knocked something out. Um, other groups went in and used similar technologies to show that they could um, use talons. We weren't the first to show talons at Missouri. A, a group at Roslyn Institute and um, Texas A&M were the first to show that they work. Um, the other thing that's interesting is a group over in Scotland at the Roslyn Institute used this technology to sample 
to go in and, and make these changes and sample lots and lots of examples until they found one that had a change that existed in a, in a pig relative, the warthog. Warthogs are naturally resistant to African swine fever. And, and we think we know the gene called RELA. And we think then we know the mutation. And so they've introduced that mutation into pigs. So we don't yet know if it works. Don't know the status. Um, I assume they're still growing up the herd to get a large enough number of animals to, to challenge. But that would be an introgression. Taking a gene that exists in nature, that we've read in a warthog, and making the same change in a pig in the hopes of making pigs that would be resistant to African swine fever in the same way that African pigs are resistant to African swine fever, the warthog. And some other things that you can do is you can go in and make modifications um, in a very pre-designed way. So the example that I gave you from Roslyn Institute, they knew what they were looking for, so they just kept looking until they found it, which meant they made a lot of pigs that didn't serve any purpose whatsoever, right? or at least cells. They didn't actually make the pigs. They made cells and then had to move on. Another group, uh, this is a, a, a group up at University of Minnesota, went in and made some very specific changes. Uh, they first illustrated this by moving the pole gene, hornless, in cattle into a high-producing um, Holstein line that's horned. So they essentially took the horns off as their first example. Um, that is a gene that naturally occurs. There's pulled cattle already, but not in any high-producing family of Holsteins. So when they made that introduction on purpose, they were able to, to make an animal that could have been made in breed, by breeding if you live long enough. I mean, no one is going to cross their polled Angus to Holsteins ever for the dairy industry because you lose too much in milk production. But you could, and then you could back cross for the next 85 years, and you could eventually get to where these guys went in a season because they introgressed that version of a gene on purpose, cow to cow, an animal that could be made by breeding. And the way they did that is, is shown over on the right. So they used um, one of these designed nucleases, cut the genome, but instead of the first two things happening, if you look at that third column on the right, there's some chew back there too, but now I've got a little green piece of DNA, and that has the sequence that I want to introduce. And at some frequency, the cell goes and looks for another copy somewhere in its genome to fix that, and it finds that introduced piece, and it just copies it into place. And and you can do this at a fairly high frequency. So you can do designed changes. So um, we used CRISPR to simultaneously begin to evaluate this in pigs. This was the pers first example. If you look up at the right, that's some embryos from our green pigs. Those are literally um, green eggs from ham up on the right. And, and we've gone in and shown that it works in pigs. We can knock out the GFP gene again. And we did a collaboration with uh, Genus, our National Swine Center, and an in-house program at Missouri. Um, we knocked out a gene on the right called CD1D. I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, but that is a gene that's involved in influenza replication. So influenza requires that gene to, to be there as part of its normal life cycle. Um, but the one on the left, CD163 knockout, is the absolutely required protein in a pig that the PERS virus needs. So when you knock that out, HERS virus cannot complete its life cycle. And um, I see someone from Choice in, in the audience. That's a, one of your land race there on the left as the recipient. Um, <clears throat> this, is the, um, this is some of the data that was in that paper. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. If you look at this top graph or this top line, that is the virus release when we inocul inoculated pigs that do not have this mutation. This is the virus release from pigs that, that were inoculated and do have that mutation. They were absolutely resistant. Right? They are so resistant that there's not even an antibody response because there's not enough antigen made. This is the antibody levels in those pigs. So they cannot get, they cannot propagate influenza. Um, we've also made some modifications to that region to help understand the virus, and we were able to make pigs um, that could barely propagate the North American strains, but not any of the um, European strains. But if you look at this last column over here where it says null, that's where it's completely knocked out. 
every strain we can get our hands on, uh, these pigs are resistant to. So they are absolutely resistant to every strain of PERS that we've been able to find. Uh, we've also been able to show that if the female has is homozygous for the mutation, she actually protects the fetuses in her uterus whether or not they have the mutation. So if you had a herd of these sows, you could protect all the piglets while they're in utero, whether or not they carry the mutation. All right, so I'm going to quit talking about that one. I will throw in one more. Uh, we have knocked out another gene that cre creates resistance to TGE, transmissible gastroenteritis. It can be vaccinated for. It's not nearly as important. But our goal is to just make pigs that don't get diseases, so we're just going to go through down the line and, and try to get them all eventually. All right, so there's my two success stories. Um, PERS is currently working its way through the regulatory agencies. So if Genus can ever get it approved by FDA, it'll be commercially available. Um, that has been licensed. University of Missouri licensed it to Genus. All right, so my haphazard collection. So notice the date, 2001, not recent. Um, these are some pigs that express phytase in their salivary glands. Um, I would argue that that's not incredibly important since phytase is so cheap and you can get it in the feed anyway, but it is one less thing. So um, those animals are essentially able in higher and higher levels of, uh, of plant-based material to still absorb all the phosphorus. So this actually works better than phytase in the feed because it's a continual delivery system. Um, that was attempted to go through FDA, and they ran out of money. University of Guelph ran out of money before they could get approval. Not enough people have called it their Congress people. And this is another example of, of the sort of things that's coming. Um, if you notice, when it's recent, it tends to be China. And when it's old, it tends to be the US, because China's putting a lot of money into this at the moment. Um, US is, is struggling to put much, if any. Uh, this is a beta-glucanase. That's an enzyme that chews up types of carbohydrates. So if you think about uh, the sort of carbohydrates that um, would be in um, fresh grass this time of year that gives cattle scours, you know, they just can't eat enough. Well, a lot of that's the water retention from these, these materials. When that ends up in pig diets, it also causes soft stool. It keeps uh, nutrient absorption lower of, of water-soluble nutrients. Uh, these animals actually have much higher digestibility of all water-soluble components because they have better absorption. And so you could do that again by putting in the feed. Um, so far, people have not found a heat-stable gluconase that handles pelleting, but eventually they will, and that, that'll compete. This is an example of moving a, a gene from one species, reading one genome, writing it in another. Uh, this is from a worm, uh, and it makes omega-3 fatty acids, the same sort of fatty acids that you see in salmon that people think of as good. This got a lot of press as, as heart-healthy pigs, but those pigs back there, as you see behind Randy Prather, um, are pigs that essentially have very high omega-3 fats naturally, regardless of what you feed them, because they make their own. So you can do stuff like that. Um, the color isn't spectacular to make the, the point here, but I think the bottom, the graph will do it on the bottom right. Essentially, um, this is a scenario where you overexpress a gene that pigs already have, and you can change the fiber types that are in the muscle. So the ratio of this gene and another determines the fiber type. So this is the fast twitch, dark twitch. So by uh, removing this gene, you could make an all white meat pig if you chose to do that. You do it in chickens and make an all white meat chicken if you chose to do that too. Um, but you can see these, this black section is the slow twitch fibers, the dark meat, the red part. Um, and there's many more of them when that's expressed. So you can start thinking about changing color, changing moisture content, changing fat content in the absence of adipose, because those, those slow twitch muscles store fat. That's why a thigh tastes good and a breast doesn't necessarily. Yeah, it's, that's the difference. Um, this is a, an interesting to think about. 1998, not new. Um, Matt Wheeler's group made this at the University of Illinois. And in this case, what they did is they took a version of a gene that they read in Holsteins, um, alpha -lactal, al, yeah, alpha lactalbumin, um, which causes very, very high milk production in those Holsteins. They introduced that version of that gene into pigs, and they made high-producing, 
high milk producing um, pig uh, sows. And as a result, um, one of the things that's neat is um, there's essentially no runts remaining in these litters. They, everybody gets enough milk. Um, and that was abandoned for regulatory reasons um, 15 years ago. Uh, this is another example of a similar sort of thing. It turns out that that same gene from humans, when it gets degraded, seems to make some antimicrobial peptides. And um, it looks like a lot of the milk proteins, when partially digested, do other things. And this is an example by a Chinese group where they've introduced um, human alpha lac into transgenic pigs. And these piglets... Uh, grow faster, they have better feed efficiency, and one of the things that you see is they also have very different microflora in their gut. The bacteria in their gut are, are quite different. So lots of stuff going. Here would be an example of a pig gene where more might be better. MX1 seems to be involved in preventing viruses from replicating, and um, these pigs were produced at cells from them. does prevent, I think you can see it in here, a classical swine fever virus from replicating. Um, We've not seen anything else from these pigs, so I don't know if they're making more or African swine fever got them or, or where they're at in the system, but they haven't seen, I haven't seen them in the literature. So what I, I would like to communicate to you is that any type of modification that you can think up, anything that a geneticist can write out on a piece of paper and say, I wish the sequence of this gene was the following, we can do. There are no technology barriers anymore. So all phenotypes can be modified. And it's three letters, all. It, it's huge. And when I think about this, all phenotypes can be modified. Novel genes can be added, things we haven't thought of. I didn't show you this example, but I've also made dairy cattle that can't get staph mastitis by creating a gene that doesn't have a counterpart that, that kills staph aureus. Um, natural alleles can be moved around. I showed you some examples of that. And um, livestock genes can be replaced with, with um, that same gene, but a different version from another species, like the warthog example, or even the human alpha lac example. So some of the stuff that, that my lab is working on is I really want to make pigs that manage themselves. And uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about and working on putting in biosynthetic pathways for nutrients. So if you think about this for a minute, Every form of life on the planet, except for the animals, everything, fungi, bacteria, plants, algae, all of them make their own amino acids. All those pathways are known. All that biochemistry is known. So we can begin to introduce those same pathways, the genes for those biochemical pathways, into pigs. So they just make their own lysine. They just make their own leucine, like everything else. Now, as we evolved, once you start eating your neighbor, you don't have to make everything anymore. That's what animals do. And plants didn't do that. They still have to make everything. Bacteria still have to make everything. So um, we actually um, have assembled all the genes, or pig versions of all the genes, to make um, both threonine and lysine. That's our first two. And so we're headed down that path. We're going to continue to work on virus resistance. I didn't share much in regard to bacterial resistance, but that's something I've been working on um, since 2000. So those sorts of things are coming. Uh, we can think about preventing foodborne illness. If you can make pig flesh that can't support bacteria, that could include spoilage organisms. That could in include um, any opportunistic pathogens. I mean, I still think that if you had that pack of chicken in the grocery store that said, genetically engineered for your safety, guaranteed salmonella free, I think people would buy it. And um, I think we could think about that for listeria, for processed meats. Um, there's lots of options. I've got a project going right now um, in regard to, to heat tolerance. I think that's going to become more and more important. It was for my walk from the parking lot a few minutes ago. It's pretty hot out there. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about how to, how to change teat number, and I can tell you right now I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, there's a couple of candidate genes that, that might allow us to change teat number. Um, and then uh, I started my career as a grad student working on the repertoire of digestive enzymes, and I'll continue to do that. 
So like the gluconase example I gave, we can think about cellulases, we can think about xylanases, we can think about a lot of enzymes that right now you put in the feed, the pig can make those. Right? Biology can make those. And pig's just a great big bag of biology. So I think that that's important to me. Um, the only limit to these technologies are imagination and money. And, and that's just where we're at right now. There are no technical limits. So I wanted to finish early because I find that audiences have lots of questions related to, to this technology. And I will tell you now, for or against, you can't offend me. So please feel free to ask any question you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I I give a lot of layman talks. Um, tip not industry talks. Layman talks. State fairs. Um, schools. Um, Sunday schools at Methodist churches. I'll give similar sorts of talks. Um, what I find is about ninety percent of the room. Um, is either scared of what I do or hates me when we start. And after we talk it through, probably 90% of the people are all for it. So I don't think we have a, a public perception issue, really. We don't have to convince the public. We make good pigs, they will want to buy them. The issue is the 4% that will hold up a picket sign and try to release pigs into the wild or try to burn down a lab or that's the concern. <laughs> I'm not going to try those experiments. Um, plus they're already bored, so it's, it's a little late to fix them. Yeah. I'm still confused on how, what tissues. Okay, so, so that, that, yep. So um, when we're making these pigs, we typically will start one of two ways. The old school way now, um, and this was a, the technology developed by PPL Therapeutics, so if you guys remember Dolly the Clone Sheep, that was PPL Therapeutics. Um, we can go through and introduce all the parts that we need into cells and culture. So we're just growing them in a dish. And then we, we can isolate individual cells and grow up enough of them that we can go in and ask what happened. And so we could sequence their genome or we could amplify across that little region. But we, we can genotype them. Once we have the cell that, that is exactly what we want, then through cloning, we can make a pig. And so they start out as a clone in that scenario. Now what's interesting about some of these technologies, and see cloning's hard, so most people can't do cloning. What's interesting about some of these is if you make a small enough needle and just squirt it into the one cell embryo, it works there too. And it works so efficiently that in every litter there's probably at least one good one, one useful pig. And um, it works in everything that anyone has looked at so far. So cattle, pigs, mice, rats, zebrafish, catfish, I mean, everything. This technology seems to work. It, does that help? And then you got to transfer the embryo to, to a gelt or... Yeah. 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 So, yeah, uh, so the, the question is uh, really related to public perception and does the topic matter? Do, do they like health issues better than growth issues? Um, so the short answer is a little bit different. So, yeah, they think of all of them separately. But the ones that really, there's two concerns. One is, are, are they, it's new, so they're afraid. It, we're afraid of things that are new. That's, that's our nature. But the other one, their real question is, who's getting filthy rich at my expense? Honestly. That's what they want to know. Be because if somebody's getting rich, it has to be at their expense. 
in, in, their, in their mind. And if you're getting filthy rich, well, you probably don't care about me anyway. So that's where you have to start the conversation. So I think these technologies are easy to sell when they provide a benefit to the consumer. I think that's where Monsanto messed up with plants. There's not a consumer in the world that goes in and looks for corn on the can, in a can because it's Roundup resistant. It, it, it doesn't benefit them. Um, those are difficult to identify. That's why I brought up the salmonella free chicken argument. I think the public would demand that. If you made those birds, I think they'd come after it. Um, most people think that disease resistance and animal welfare are going to be easier to accept than a lot of other things. Um, I, I really wish that the growth hormone salmon hadn't been first. Because, one, people are afraid of the word hormone. That's, it's scary, right? Um, it's a protein hormone you eat all you want. It's not going to do anything. But steroid hormone would. Well, sort of. Um, so <laughs> I do think it matters. But I think what matters most is, because typically by now someone has brought up educating the public, and that's not the answer, because they don't want to be educated. The important part is listening to the public, figuring out what their concerns is, what their concerns are, letting them voice them, and just talking them through. Most people are rational. And, and so our biggest problem is, uh, from a regulatory, not from a regulatory point of view, from a funding point of view, is the perception of public perception. Because I don't think the public is against this. That's not my experience. There are people in the public that are against it. But I don't think the vast majority are. And the, why, the reason why that matters is, and I mean, talk to people here. Talk to any of the people that are, any of the genetics houses. As far as I can tell, only one has been willing to take the risk and put their name associated with funding one of these projects. Because everybody wants to be second. Because second's okay. First, it's a target. It's a risk. And so it's hard to be responsible with your company if you're one of the genetics houses and take this risk unless you just think it's going to be a blockbuster. Yeah? Now, we know the benefits of the Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. So, we, as as far as I can tell, no one has found any yet with this gene. I guarantee you, with some of them, the answer is going to be yes. Um, and I think everyone in the room has already experienced this. You take a high-producing, high-growth pig and compare it to feral pigs out in the wild. One's more robust than the other. Right? It's really, it's a whole lot easier to trip a kid that's running than one that's moving quite slowly. These, these fast-growth animals, there's just way too many things that can go wrong. I absolutely think that there will be times when we make these modifications and decide it's not worth it. I don't think PERS is that one, but I know I don't know yet. I mean, so one of the things that will happen is um, those animals will have to get challenged with just about everything that we can think of at some point to know that answer. Um, and it's one of those things that if it gets in the market and we notice it, it won't sell anymore. And if, if Genus gets to the market with this and PIC starts selling it and it is great and then it's not, the market will take care of it pretty fast, I think. Now, I don't think it's going to happen. But I, I guarantee you there will be a great idea that turns out to be a bad idea. There always is. Time for one final question. That's fine. I don't get I don't get pushback. Uh, I get a lot of frowns and and some bad 
So, I mean, I have stood in front of an audience about four times this size that were all employees of a single drug company. And, and I told them the same thing I'll tell you right now. My goal is to make them have no market whatsoever. I, I don't need another needle in another pig. So if we can make pigs that are resistant and don't need vaccines, that's what we should do, and it's irresponsible not to, from my point of view. It's, especially for some influenza, like influenza. Think about this for a minute. So our epidemics for influenza come from birds or pigs. They don't come from people. Not our big epidemics. They come from birds or pigs. It is irresponsible for us to not use these technologies and allow that zoonosis to occur, from my perspective. I mean, we have to be thinking about these things. Um, but I thought by now some of the drug companies would actually start funding some of this work. And my guess is they are in ways that I can't see. But I don't, I don't have an example. They're not funding my lab. <laughs> Let's not thank Dr. Wells. I'm sure he'll be available. Uh, so.